Finally, we can get to our Chosen Season 4 finale overview right here on The Chosen Sleuth. We've had some other stuff holding us off from putting out this video, but now finally we can talk about Episode 8. There's a lot of really cool things here. While most of Episode 8 is kind of a setup episode, there's a lot of really unique and amazing parts to this whole thing that sets up Season 5 really, really well. I'm excited to deep dive this, but of course, as I've been telling you, all of our deep dives for Episodes 1 through 8 will be coming out whenever the episodes come out on the app. At least that's what I'm hoping to do. If it takes too long, then I'll just end up doing my deep dives anyways, and I just won't have as much footage to show you during that. I hope that's not the case, because I'd love to go over some of these clips, some of these scenes, and really deep dive into that. Also, Season 5 is going to be starting up soon, and we're going to be doing behind-the-scenes content about all of Season 5 when they're shooting and what they're filming, and trying to sleuth out exactly what's coming up in Season 5. So if you want to be a part of that, make sure you subscribe to the channel and like this video, because it'll really help to get out to more people. Now, at the start of this season finale we actually see a flashback this is like we do in most of the other ending episodes of the seasons we see as king david actually returns home to jerusalem and this is a really unique scene we see as the whole crowd is surrounded around him as he's traveling through a city street they're waving palm fronds and putting down clothes in front of the horse that he's riding they're also singing a song hosanna our king is victorious over and over and over again praising david for his victory against the ammonites then we cut to an indoor scene with david greeting his family and his son daniel now daniel also known as chiliab is david's second son after solomon this is by his wife abigail and so we're actually getting a look into david's life after bathsheba or a different wife during bathsheba and some of these different family things that are kind of going on there again david had multiple wives and multiple children as well there's a lot of different family lines that come here. Then David mentions that it's almost Passover, six days to Passover in fact. He asks if the rites have been performed yet because he wants to perform them himself with his son Daniel. So David takes Daniel to another part of the city or another part of the palace and has a spotless lamb brought to them. This of course is for Passover, the Passover lamb. But here they're actually going to anoint the lamb's feet. This is six days before Passover. They also mention that two days before Passover you would anoint the lamb's head. Now this is an interesting thing that kind of carries throughout the episode of course we're going to see this later on with jesus specifically being our passover lamb however here in this i'm not exactly sure how biblical of a tradition or ritual this is i couldn't really find any details in my research about where this came from i don't see any uh anywhere in scripture where this was done where they would anoint the lamb six days before and then two days before on the head um i, I didn't really see this anywhere so i'm not exactly sure where this comes from i'll try to do some more research and in our deep dives maybe have some better answers for you here then in the rest of this david portion we actually see that he explains kind of what passover is a little bit and talks about the unleavened bread when it comes to passover which of course they can't have yeast in their bread during this time then also he shows his son the bridle that was passed down from the time of moses this happens to be in the chosen the same bridle that mary and joseph have passed on to jesus because obviously they come from the line of david we'll definitely talk about the bridal during the deep dives but this is another one of those things it's a fictional addition to the storyline here uh, and of course it's not a massive thing but it is an added thing whenever we talk about the triumphal entry and everything kind of happening there then after the intro song we actually get a scene with jesse and veronica as they're shouting and evangelizing about jesus but specifically talking about lazarus being raised from the dead and how many witnesses were there the word has spread and everybody knows that lazarus is alive this is a really 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 big thing in the book of john especially when we read through the gospels because this is a massive point whenever the sanhedrin and the sadducees specifically really really want to take out jesus especially because of the resurrection of the dead and him having the power to do that this is a very scary thing that's kind of happening here that being said the sadducees of course aren't just going to sit there and do nothing gadara is actually there in front of jesse and veronica rebuking them and telling them that they're wrong the whole time they actually switch the conversation over to jesus as well asking the question if he's going to be here for passover or not and Gadara says of course not he's a coward why would he come here for passover um and 
and then they kind of fight back and forth a little bit saying of course he's not a coward he just faced you guys right here on Solomon's porch just a few days ago right uh, as they obviously tried to stone Jesus in a previous episode so there's a lot of stuff kind of happening here but this is a really cool scene where we get to see Jesse and Veronica again Jesse of course being Simon the Zealot's brother and then Veronica the woman that had the issue of blood um, in last season so uh, really cool to see them again and um, we'll see more of them later in this episode as well next we finally get to see Pilot in this season now Pilot of course is going to continue to become a bigger and bigger part of the chosen of course heading into season five and season six all of these characters are in Jerusalem for this week okay all of them are here they're not spread out all over the place anymore we're not really going to be traveling to Capernaum or to these other locations anymore the rest of Jesus's time on earth is spent in Jerusalem with his apostles with all the big bad guys like Pilate and Caiaphas and everybody so everything is going to be condensed into this Jerusalem kind of environment now here we see Pilate and Atticus talking about Passover, talking about Jesus, and even talking about Lazarus. They begin by talking about unleavened bread and how Pilate might be hiding some, some bread with yeast in it, <laughs> as obviously he's not Jewish, he's not celebrating the Passover, and uh, of course he loves his flatbread, uh, being a Roman, of course. So it was kind of a funny moment there, talking about the different cultures and different understandings, and Pilate says, you know, I, I, it's, it's not that I don't understand, I just don't really care about this whole thing. And of course, Pilate being a Roman official wouldn't really care about the whole Jewish practices and everything happening there. We get to see a bit more of this later on with Herod and Herodias, uh, as well as Chusa and Joanna at a, at a dinner that they have uh, with the Romans as well, which is really interesting. Now, overall, with this conversation between Pilate and Atticus, we get to see some really unique things with Pilate and even Atticus here as they begin to talk about what's happening in the world around them. They're talking about Passover. They're talking about Jesus. They're talking about Lazarus being raised. And all of this is, it's really unsettling for Atticus. For Atticus, he's really having a hard time, you know, figuring out what is actually going on here. He's seen too much to say that it's nothing, but he hasn't seen enough to explain exactly what it is. And so now Pilate is seeing how unnerved Atticus is, and that really throws Pilate off. Because in this relationship that we have in The Chosen, Pilate is almost like a understudy to Atticus in a lot of ways. Atticus is a mentor and a friend that he's had for a long time. And so for the two of them, they're kind of feeding off of each other. Atticus is trying to give advice to Pilate and help him to lead properly. And Pilate is reading off of Atticus how things are going and what is actually happening in the world. And so we're seeing as Pilate begins to get kind of thrown off by Atticus and trying to figure out what is actually going on here. Does he actually believe that Lazarus was raised from the dead? They're calling him the ghost of Bethany. It's true then. I have seen some things that uh, I can't explain. And there's a lot of really unique things happening here between the two of them, but Overall, Atticus is definitely trying to warn Pilate, hey, you need to be careful, you need to think about what you're doing, Tiberius isn't going to give you another chance. And one of the big things that actually happens in this scene is that Pilate is asking why Tiberius, the emperor of Rome, isn't sending more troops to help with this whole Passover thing because there's millions of Jews here that could potentially overthrow Rome or potentially try to cause a revolt. So why wouldn't Tiberius send more troops to help him out? And the, basically they come to the conclusion of Pilate and Atticus think that Tiberius is testing Pilate, um, trying to see if he can go one week without an incident. And of course, one week is a very specific amount of time as it's not only Passover, but also the whole situation with Jesus is happening at this time. Um, when everything is happening in the temple and everything is happening with Jesus being crucified, that's this week. So it's going to be a very, very intense week. Now, something important to mention that happens a bit later is they also talk about Caiaphas and what Caiaphas's response is going to be to this as well talking about Jesus of Nazareth and what is going to be happening there. Now, there's a couple different players that we have to be worried about, right? And we're going to talk about them later as well. But of course, we've got Pilate, we've got Caiaphas, and we have Herod and Herodias. All three of these people are kind of in this area, these, these leaders here um, that are going to be reacting to Jesus and seeing what's going on here. The next scene we see is Mary of Bethany is at an oriental trader trying to buy some perfume. Now, we don't really know what this is for yet, 
unless you read the scriptures, then you definitely know what this is for. But we see as the trader is showing her all these different perfumes and really amazing stuff, but none of it is good enough for what Mary has in mind. She pulls out a large sack of coins and puts it on the table. Of course, she got this earlier on after Lazarus's money had been transferred to her and Martha. And of course, she's just using this family money in order to buy this perfume. I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> it's a great thing, obviously, for what she's doing it for. Um, but this is a lot of money that she has here. She puts all the money on the table and says, I want the stuff that's not for sale. I've been to a lot of rich people's houses and dinners, and I know that you have stuff that isn't out here. And so the Oriental trader basically says, um, oh, okay, I'll, I'll go see what I have. <laughs> and she goes in the back and she pulls out a full bottle of pure spikenard. Now, this is a very expensive perfume. This is used to anoint the dead, essentially. Um, but obviously, this is a large amount of it in this whole alabaster jar right here. Now, the chosen here, again, is kind of mixing two stories together. Uh, there are two separate times, at least some people believe they're separate times, where a woman comes and she anoints Jesus uh, before his burial. One of those is Mary of Bethany, and another one is the woman with the alabaster jar. We're not exactly sure um, who this woman is, uh, or if it's the same person, if they're both Mary of Bethany, uh, or if they're other people entirely. So we're not exactly sure in scripture if these are two separate stories or one story. However, in the chosen, just like they've done with several other things, several other uh, themes or miracles or moments, um, they've kind of added them together and made them one moment here. Now the vendor asks Mary how much of this perfume she wants, and she says one ounce, two ounce, but Mary says, no, I want the whole jar. And the vendor protests. She's like, this is like a lot of money, first of all, and I need more of this in order to serve my other clients who I have throughout the city and throughout the areas that I travel. And Mary's like, well, I'll, I'll buy it. And she pulls out another bag of coins, puts it on the table, and is able to buy this entire jar. She says, here, here's 300 denarii. This is a full year's wage. Go ahead and take the year off if you need to go find more spikenard. Uh, but here, I'll pay you this. Just give me the full jar. And she says, this is for the greatest king the world has ever known. Of course, talking about Jesus here. Now, this is really important. In scripture, we see this referenced as well as 300 denarii. We don't actually see the purchase of the perfume, of course, but we see the outcome that comes a bit later on, and we'll talk about that in just a bit. Next, we get a really interesting scene back in the Great Sanhedrin. Now, of course, we know that Yusuf and Shmuel are kind of buddy-buddy now in the Great Sanhedrin, but the rest of the group obviously is very much against Jesus, even to the point of, you know, having this coup and wanting to basically kill him him, right? Um, and so now we see as Gadara and the rest of them, Caiaphas, everybody is talking about how they're going to take out Jesus, how they're going to show that he's a fraud, even though they don't know really how he's doing all these different things. They've heard about Lazarus and Lazarus being raised. And they're saying, well, nobody can raise from the dead except for Elijah. And then you know, they kind of talk about, is Jesus Elijah? <laughs> and Shmuel kind of points us out. Yusuf kind of points us out. And they're kind of confused about it as well, right? Especially Shmuel. He's not exactly sure who Jesus is, but he doesn't think that they should just throw him out altogether right now. They need to have some discussion with him and they need to be able to talk through what is actually happening here. And so Shmuel and Yusuf actually speak up during this meeting of the Sanhedrin, which is a pretty big deal. And both of them talk about what is happening here and how they can give Jesus a chance here. Um, this is very reminiscent in scripture to where we see Nicodemus actually standing up for Jesus in the great Sanhedrin. If that does happen, it'll happen in season five, most likely. Um, and then we'll see Nicodemus again in season six during the burial. At least that's my hope. <laughs> I would love to see Nicodemus again since we, see, we haven't seen him since season one. Um, so it's been a very, very long time at this point. However, during this Sanhedrin meeting, we do see as Shmuel specifically asks Caiaphas, if he can go and speak with Jesus, um, speak with Lazarus, try to figure out what is going on here um, and, and see if they can get any answers. This brings us to one of the parts that I'm most excited to deep dive into, and that is Caiaphas's prophecy. Now in scripture, we see this prophecy as well, where Caiaphas says, I have, I've had this vision. I've had this prophecy delivered to me by God that says that 
a man will die for the people so our nation will not perish. Now, this is a legit thing that actually happens in scripture. Caiaphas has this vision or this prophecy that shows that a man will die, one man will die, so that the rest of the nation will be saved. And of course, this does not mean what Caiaphas thinks it means. And scripture even tells us that, that he misunderstood what was actually happening here. He said these things not because he understood them, but because he had them delivered to him, right? And so this is a really, really interesting part. I can't can't wait to dive into this uh, prophecy from Caiaphas here. Now, after this point, we see Shmuel and Yusuf talk about what they need to do, and they decide pretty quickly in this quick scene to go and visit Lazarus. Yes, all of us, myself included, have been too quick to take offense toward Jesus. The Sanhedrin is well beyond that. Because Yusuf's father, Arnon, has already visited Lazarus and the family during the Shiva, and he even witnessed the raising of Lazarus. So, of course, going to Lazarus' house would be a great first step in order to meet Lazarus and potentially Jesus as well. So they head out with Arnon, actually, and they go towards Bethany. Hey, if you're enjoying this content, real quick, I wanted to let you know about the best way to support us on this channel. If you want to see behind-the-scenes content, extra content, and even our trip to Israel, which is coming up in just a couple of weeks, then definitely you're going to want to sign up to patreon at snipesupport.com that's the link down in the description down below and in the top pinned comment this is going to be the best way to, for you to help us to continue to make videos like this continue to spend our time researching and talking about these episodes and other christian media projects that are coming out soon there's a lot of stuff that we're working on and we want you to be a part of it so make sure you go to snipesupport.com in order to help us out over there all right, let's get back to the video. Then we jump back over to Capernaum. This is a really interesting scene, but also kind of a sad one. We see as Gaius is actually talking to Eden and Barnaby and all the other Capernaum residents that haven't left for Jerusalem quite yet. Of course, Passover is a major Jewish holiday. This is not something that you just skip out on and you have to go to the temple in order to practice and do the rituals and do everything that you need to for Passover specifically. This is not just a holiday like Christmas, like we celebrate today, where you're just at home and you celebrate by yourself. No, you have to go to Jerusalem. You have to travel there as much as you can, right? Of course, there are, there are excuses of people being sick or not able to travel. But for the most part, most people would travel to Jerusalem for Passover. That would mean that millions of Jews, not only from Israel, but actually beyond Israel, would come in and be a part of the festivities here in order to celebrate Passover and the exodus from Egypt. Now, while everybody's getting ready and getting into these carts, we see as Gaius is talking to them, giving messages to the apostles, of course, Peter and Matthew and Jesus as well. He sends Jesus his love. He sends Peter, shalom, shalom. <laughs> and of course, Matthew, he just wants to make sure he's okay. And he's kind of afraid of talking about his feelings. Of course, he loves Matthew and wants to make sure that he's good. And Eden promises to pass along these different messages. Now they talk about, hey, Gaius, you could come to, you know, celebrate Passover with us if you wanted. <laughs> and of course he can't, he's now the praetor of Capernaum. He needs to take care of the city and he can't just up and leave and go on this trip here, right? He's got his family here and everything else. And so he declines that offer, but thanks them for being kind basically. Now this is a really unique moment because throughout this whole moment, it really felt like Gaius's season finale. It felt like his series finale. Gaius has been there since season one, but now everybody is going to Jerusalem. All of our main characters, all of our side characters, everybody is in Jerusalem except for Gaius. And now Gaius is kind of stuck in Capernaum. I don't think we're going to be seeing much more of Gaius, if any at all. Uh, in the last few seasons. And that's unfortunate. We love Gaius for sure. He's amazing. Uh, one of the best characters, one of the most amazing character arcs that we've seen throughout The Chosen. However, it's just the case that he probably won't be there uh, for the rest of the seasons, or if he is, it'll be a very small role. Um, I would expect to maybe see him in the last season as the church is kind of growing and people are meeting in Peter's house, etc. cetera. Um, but you know, we'll have to see. We'll have to see where that goes uh, with Dallas's writing and what actually happens there. Now, cutting back to Bethany and Lazarus's house, we see as some of the apostles wake up in the morning. First off, we see Judas as he wakes up before anybody else immediately heads to the money bag and steals more money. 
Then he looks over to his right and he sees as Thomas is actually heading out with a shovel and something in his hand. At first, I thought this was Thomas going to the bathroom <laughs> because they're like in the middle of, <laughs> of the desert here. I figured, you know, hey, he's just going out to the wilderness. He's going to dig a, dig a hole and go to the bathroom. <laughs> but that doesn't seem to be the case. Judas follows Thomas out into the wilderness. Thomas does dig a hole and then he actually buries the sundial that he gave to Rama underneath the ground and fills back in the hole. Now, Judas is watching him this whole entire time. We actually hear Judas's theme that we've talked about many times again. Uh, and there's something conniving kind of going on here for Judas. For Thomas, this is kind of him burying Rama, right, in a lot of ways. He wasn't able to be there for her Shiva. He wasn't able to mourn her properly, at least in a Jewish sense. And so Thomas is really, really struggling throughout all of this, especially with Lazarus being raised. Now, the sundial was hers. It was his betrayal trollow gift to her and so now he's getting rid of that and he's burying it saying that it's dead right um, and so this is a really interesting point here i think that also judas may be digging up that sundial and maybe selling it for some coin for himself as we've seen him be very selfish and uh, really diving into this uh, new role that he's kind of playing here um now, we're, we're, we've expected this change from Judas for sure. Um, we're seeing it really, really decline now as he's coming into this and, and making the wrong decisions over and over and over again and really not listening at all. Then in a pretty quick scene, we see as Herod and Herodias and Chusa actually arrive in Jerusalem. Now, of course, Joanna and Cassandra are both here as Chusa has his mistress and his wife technically still <laughs> with him. It's a very weird situation here. But we see as they arrive in Jerusalem and they talk about the different festivities that's going on and specifically they talk about how this is a little bit different specifically because of Jesus and everything that's happening there. Um, and he wants to kind of meet Jesus, Herod does. Herod wants to kind of meet Jesus because he thinks he's entertaining. It's kind of the same thing as John the Baptist. He thought John the Baptist was really interesting and he found him really intriguing. That's why he liked him and didn't want to execute him. But then Herodias wanted to have him executed, so he did. So anyway, there's a lot of stuff kind of going on here. But then Chusa comes up with a message from Caiaphas and then it kind of cuts from there. Now, what does this letter say we don't exactly know but we can guess that it definitely talks about jesus and of course from our sanhedrin scene earlier we know that caiaphas is going to try to manipulate this in order for the romans to have a you know jesus on their bad side they want them to do some sort of action against jesus during this time then we cut to one of the largest scenes in this episode which is the dinner at bethany lazarus has just been raised and this is a very happy moment for all of them they hear a knock at the door and martha answers the door and it's arnon of course a friend of lazarus's that had done business with him previously that also saw him being raised so he's the connection point here for everything but he also brings along with him as we talked about earlier yusuf his son and shmuel now this this is a really interesting thing because this is the first time that we've seen Shmuel interact with the entire group since season one, episode six, where he really tore into them, right? Since then, he's been working behind the scenes to shut them down, to get Jesus arrested, and to really deal with this whole situation. Arnon begins to introduce Yusuf and Shmuel, but of course, Jesus already knows them both, both being from Capernaum and having a long history with them since season one. So this has been over three years now that they've known each other and kind of gone into this. And of course, Jesus invites them to the table. A bit hesitant, they kind of sit down and begin to have some conversation with Jesus and trying to understand him a bit better, specifically Shmuel. First things first, they talk about what's going on in the Sanhedrin, how everybody is arguing about Jesus and debating whether or not he should be able even to live or what's going on there. They're warning him that this is very serious and that the Sanhedrin is against him in many ways. They're talking about everything that's actually happening here but most of all Shmuel wants to know what Jesus's plan is what is actually going on here specifically he asks do you have an army we don't know about everyone during this time thinks that Jesus is going to be a conquering king he's going to come back just like David did after defeating the Ammonites and he's going to have everyone live in peace after he destroys Rome but this is not how it works right this is not actually how it's going to happen and they're all going to be very disappointed when they find that out Shmuel, most of all, even in this scene here. Now, Judas, during this point, even tries to get Shmuel to help in all of this. He's trying to get Shmuel to unite the Sanhedrin and help Jesus to become an army, right? Because Judas really wants to see this happen as well. We've seen that all throughout this season and last season, as Judas really thought that this was going to be an army that was going to be taken up and that they were going to fight the Romans. Uh, 
that's not happening. Judas hasn't seen any of that. And so because of that, he's kind of disillusioned to what is actually happening here. He doesn't know if he can trust Jesus fully. And so he's pushing Shmuel to kind of help and be an ally in this as well. Now the conversation gets to a point where Jesus asks Shmuel, what do you hope for in a Messiah? And he says, of course, I want to see a new Davidic kingdom. I want to see as, as the Messiah drives out our oppressors and brings peace and glory to Israel. Then Jesus asks, what will you do on that day? And of course, Shmuel doesn't really know. He says, worship, serve, I hope. <laughs> I'm not really sure. I'm not, I'm not in that day. You know, I don't know what will happen. But here's when Jesus goes into a unique teaching from Matthew 25, where it talks about separation and judgment day and how the people that know Jesus will have served the least of these. And those that don't will have ignored them and treated them like trash. And so this is a really hard teaching. And even Shmuel says that. He says, this is a hard teaching. And I think I don't think he understands that the Messiah would be associated with the lowest, the least of these. Because in the Sanhedrin's mind and in Shmuel's mind, the Messiah should be the highest. He should be the king. He should be untouchable. He should be way greater than the least of these. And yet Jesus humbled himself even to the point of being born into this world and dying on a cross. And he just doesn't understand that. And of course, he won't for a little while. Now, the next scripture that Jesus says, I felt was a little bit weird in this context here at this dinner. This is supposed to have been said at the Last Supper, but he talks about John 13, 30 to 35. And so this is a really, it's a really cool verse where Jesus says, basically, a new commandment I give to you to love one another. Uh, this is how they, they will know that you're my disciples is how you love one another. And so it's a really cool verse. I love this verse, um, but it is said during the Last Supper for a very specific specific reason. So we'll talk about this a little bit more in the deep dives, but um, it was interesting that it's here and I don't necessarily see the purpose of it being exactly here with Shmuel. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about it more a little bit later. And the last thing that Shmuel gets to talk about here is the Jewish traditions and culture. He asks Jesus if he's going to do away with these things. And Jesus says that he will be the fulfillment of these things. And so Shmuel is kind of confused about that a little bit. He begins to ask some more questions. And as that happens, Mary of Bethany walks into the dinner here. Now, remember, Shmuel has never met Mary. He doesn't know who she is or why she's here or why she's crying. <laughs> it's very in intense moment here. As Shmuel is kind of like trying to figure out what's going on. He even asks who she is and Lazarus answers, that's my sister. And of course, Shmuel kind of like is trying to c carry on the conversation. He's trying to talk with Jesus because this is a very important moment. Uh, and he's like, this, this woman doesn't know what's happening here. She doesn't understand what's going on. This is a very important moment. We need to be talking here. And of course, Mary kind of barges in and immediately she gets down on her knees and begins to anoint Jesus's feet. Now this really startles Shmuel. Of course, this is a woman who's not married to this man touching him in public. This is a big, big no-no. And the fact that she's anointing his feet like this with her hair, she's taking off of her head covering. It, there's so much that's wrong with this for Shmuel. And he's really, really, freaked out by it. Pretty immediately, he says that Arnon and Yusuf and him need to leave. They need to get out of here. This is not okay. They should not be, uh, you know, condoning this. They should not be endorsing this. They need to leave right now. And Yusuf says that he wants to stay to see what Jesus says about this. Now, Judas also questions during this time. This is a big part in scripture. Whenever the woman comes to anoint Jesus's feet, Judas actually speaks up and says that this could have been sold for a year's wages and given to the poor. Now, he says this not because he wants to give to the poor, but because he would like that money because he's been stealing money from the group, right? This has been happening in the chosen. This is what happens exactly in scripture. Judas is definitely seeing this as a contradiction. Jesus, in one hand, says that we need to give to the poor. We need to take care of the poor. But in the other hand, he has this very expensive perfume put on his feet. And he says to them, you will always have the poor, but you will not always have me. Again, alluding to his death, but not everybody really understands this. Jesus is very clear here as well. He says, she has anointed my body for burial. This is a really, really big deal, but Shmuel cannot handle this at all. Um, Jesus tries to explain to him like, hey, the whole head covering thing, it's just a tradition. You know, it's not a law that she's breaking here. There's a lot of things that like, hey, dude, it's okay. <laughs> like, Stop freaking out. But Shmuel just continues to, to get more and more kind of... Um, uh, 
worried about this. He does not know how to handle this at all. And so he says it's wasteful. It's immodest. Uh, it completely contradicts what he was just talking about, which Judas agrees with him on. Um, and Judas is kind of dissenting along with Shmuel here. It's really interesting to see this as both of them kind of take a step away from Jesus. Um, really, really intense here. And I think this one line kind of explains all of what Shmuel is going through here. He says, I came here to give you a chance and you ruined it. And Judas as well, missing the point again, he says to him, Rabbi, this is not a man that you want upset if you want to unite our people. Again, he just he just does not get it here. And then at the very end of the scene, we see as Yusuf leans into Jesus and says, for burial? Because he heard that part that Jesus said, but he wasn't quite sure what it means. But now Yusuf is getting an idea of what is actually going to be happening here. Jesus is preparing himself for his own death. And Yusuf is beginning to realize that. As we follow Shmuel outside, we see that he's very flustered, standing by the cart that him and Arnon and Yusuf came to Bethany in. And he's ready to leave. He, he just wants to get out of here. But Judas comes outside and they end up talking for a little bit. And it's really interesting, the conversation that we see here. And it definitely leans into what we're going to see in season five and season six uh, between the two of them. We see as Shmuel is basically saying how Judas has the most sense out of all of these people and that he was right to kind of dissent here. And Judas says, well, I'm surprised I was the only one that dissented. Clearly, Jesus was contradicting himself, right? <laughs> We see this is the first time where Judas is very blatantly kind of against what Jesus said here. Not that he was, you know, he wasn't mad about something else earlier on or even earlier this season with the Romans, but here clearly he's even telling Jesus to his face that he made a mistake and that he's wrong. Um, this is definitely the lowest that we've seen Judas so far, and it's just going to get worse and worse from here. Judas again brings up the fact that this could be their chance during Passover to overthrow Rome and to do all the things that Judas has been wanting the Messiah to do. Now Shmuel kind of agrees and he shows how this could be a chance here, but he doesn't see Jesus as the Messiah. And while Judas does still see Jesus as the Messiah, he thinks that he's making mistakes and things here, which is so interesting to me to see how Judas's mind would think there. Judas is really struggling hard to reconcile these two things in his life, how he wants Jesus to be and how he sees that Jesus actually is. And both him and Shmuel are going to have to figure out <laughs> how to make those things work together. And of course, that's why he's justifying so many of these different things and trying to say that Jesus is making a mistake or that he's wrong about these certain things. Um, it's really interesting to watch his brain kind of work around these issues. And of course, at the end, this is going to come to a betrayal from Judas. At the end of the short conversation, Judas says, I, I, I better go. And then Shmuel says, can we talk again? Now, this is, a, of course, a huge setup for season five where we believe the betrayal is going to take place. And so, of course, this is going to be massive, right? Shmuel, what is his involvement going to be in uh, the whole betrayal process? Is he the one that's going to give the money to Judas in order to betray Jesus? Is Shmuel another biblical character? We'll talk about that in our deep dives as well. Um, there's some things that I might like about this, and there's some things that I might be worried about in the future if they're kind of pointing towards it. So we'll talk more about that in our deep dives for sure. At the very end of the scene, we see as Yusuf and Arnon make their way outside as well, and Lazarus is kind of following them to the door. Yusuf, at the very end of the scene, really wants to make sure that Lazarus knows that he does not agree with Shumuel and that he's definitely on a different page here. And Lazarus already kind of picked up on that from the dinner earlier. Then we cut from one dinner to another with the Roman leaders. We see as Herod, Herodias, Pilate, and Claudia, Joanna, and Chusa, and of course Chusa's girlfriend Cassandra, all are having dinner in the Roman area of the city in Jerusalem. And so we see here as they're eating together and talking about Passover and what is actually going on during this time. One of the interesting parts is that Herod is talking about how special this Passover is, how it's different from all the other years. Most of the time people would make excuses saying that they're too tired or they're too ill or they can't make the journey. Journey. But this year, everybody is going to be here. And Pilate asks, why is that? And of course, he already knows about Jesus and everything that's going on, but he wants to get more information out of Herod and kind of see what he knows and see it from his perspective. I am somewhat curious about the uh, miracle worker. And so Herod says, well, apparently there's some sort of miracle worker here. And he says, oh, I think I've heard about him. What's his name again? <laughs> kind of like talking through this and everything. Claudia actually speaks up and says, 
Jesus of Nazareth. And he, Pilate kind of gets mad at this. He's like, ah, I wanted to hear Herod say it. I wanted to hear it from him. Um, but now they begin to have this conversation about Jesus and what is actually going on here. Now, one thing is Herod begins to talk about it. And so does Pilate, but Pilate really pokes at Herod's kind of pride and his power by saying that he's heard whispers of a new king. Now, of course, this is everybody referencing Jesus as the Messiah. And if he's the Messiah, then of course, he's going to be this new earthly king as everybody knows that he's going to be right. Um, and here Pilate kind of pokes that at, at Herod and Herod really does not like this at all. Now I will say here just through the character understanding and seeing Herod for the first time, really, um, I love the way that he was played here in the first scene that we saw him in in episode one, he was very kind of quiet and murmuring. He was very drunk and slurry with his words. And so we really couldn't hear much of what he was saying at all. Um, in this scene here, I really think he did a great job of being that leader figure. And I thought the casting was perfect here on both Herod and Herodias. As I've talked about before, Shireen, who plays Herodias, I think she does an amazing job here as well. Now, just as Pilate poked at Herod about the new king, now, Herod pokes back at Pilate about what the threat of this could actually be. And we see that this escalates pretty quickly. Now, Herod talks about this letter that he got from Caiaphas. And in that letter specifically, they talk about the dangers of what Jesus could bring. That Jesus could unite all the Jews and this could become as big as a revolt as the Maccabees. And of course, this is a massive revolt in which Rome was actually defeated for a time by the Maccabees. And so... This is a scary thing in Pilate's mind. And of course, he doesn't want to see this happen because Tiberius then would get rid of him. If he didn't die in this revolt, Tiberius would handle him himself. Before this point in the conversation, Pilate thought this was just like a joking matter, that Jesus was just this magician who was going to come in and he was going to, you know, cause a little bit of stirring, but nothing really bad. But now he's truly understanding how big of a deal this is, especially from that letter from Caiaphas, saying this could be really a huge, huge, huge deal if it's not dealt with properly properly. So of course, Pilate is really freaking out at this, but he doesn't let it phase him too much in front of these other Roman officials. Now the conversation here gets really, really interesting as well as they start to talk about Lazarus too. They talk about how he was raised from the dead and if this is really real or not. But Pilate says, you know, if we want to make sure that people don't think Lazarus was raised from the dead, why don't we just make sure he's not raised from the dead? In other words, kill him. And so Herod says that he'll pass this idea along to Caiaphas. And of course, this is exactly what happens in scripture. In John chapter 12, we actually see the plot to kill Lazarus as well. As Lazarus has caused such a stir and so many people are believing in Jesus because of Lazarus, to get rid of him would be the best case for them. And just trying to stop all of this from happening during this last week of Jesus's life here. Now, one of the most interesting parts of this conversation happens at the very end when Claudia actually mentions, well, if you killed Lazarus, wouldn't Jesus just raise him again? <laughs> if he really did raise him, why wouldn't he just raise him again? And this shows that Claudia is actually thinking about the possibility of who Jesus is. And especially since she's been having these dreams, this could be an indication that she is starting to believe in Jesus, or at least believe something in that area. This brings us exactly to our next scene, which is between Claudia and Joanna. Now, the two of them are kind of looking down on the Jewish people as they're celebrating the beginning of Passover and everything that's happening there. They're kind of jealous in a way, as these people believe in something so much, and they could never see themselves in that position, especially being such high parts of Rome here. These two women in the Roman society really relate to each other a lot. They both have high standards and what they're kind of going through. Both of them aren't sleeping in the same bed as their husbands, because Claudia thrashes too much, and, well, Chusa is with another woman <laughs> so <laughs> there's some issues there for sure between their marriages but there's a lot of things that they obviously have in common being women of power within Rome. They start talking about if Pilate is taking Jesus seriously. And Claudia says he's trying not to because Pilate doesn't want to see the danger that Jesus actually brings to him and his position. And he doesn't want to have to deal with all of this. Again, he doesn't want any trouble because if he has any trouble, Tiberius will definitely do something with him, which is what the ladies talk about next. Both of them feel that the tension is building and Joanna even steals a line from Star Wars and says, I have a bad feeling about this. <laughs> Technically, she says, I have a bad feeling about it, but it's close enough. Claudia then says, either we both have bad intuition or 
something serious is about to happen. And even though they both think that something bad is about to happen, they don't really have any power to do anything about it. And this is where Joanna brings up feeling like a prop in the theater of power for her husband and for Herod and for really everybody. And of course, Claudia feels the same. But at the end of this conversation, Claudia does say that she thinks that it could be different. They just need to believe in something as much as these people, pointing to the Jewish people celebrating Passover. Now, this whole moment here with Joanna and Claudia, I think is alluding to the fact that both of these women, at least in tradition, are said to be followers of Christ. Specifically for Joanna, we actually see her in scripture, obviously being a follower of Christ. But then for Claudia, we see in tradition after the death and resurrection of Christ that she becomes a follower as well. So this would be a really interesting thing to see, but we don't really get any biblical evidence of that since the only time she's really mentioned is during this dream during the trial of Jesus asking Pontius Pilate not to hurt him. Then we get a very short scene that's really, really funny. Basically, the whole point of the scene is to show us that the people from Capernaum have come and arrived in Bethany, but we see that John and Big James are sitting at a table eating cinnamon cakes, but they're not their Emma's cinnamon cakes, not Salome's cinnamon cakes. These are Martha's cinnamon cakes. And so they feel really guilty about eating cinnamon cakes made by another woman. <laughs> <laughs> but they really are enjoying Martha's cinnamon cakes and they feel kind of guilty about it. Right at this time, Nathaniel actually comes and asks what they're doing uh, and also says that Salome and Zebedee have arrived here in Bethany. And of course, the two of them are so like, scared and confused they don't want to show that they're eating someone else's cinnamon cakes and they hide them away and then of course they look at each other and say it's like she knew <laughs> really funny scene now of course here we are closing in on the triumphal entry and getting prepared for holy week and everything that's going to be happening there we see as jesus is getting things ready and he sends matthew and simon the zealot into a nearby town in order to grab a cult the cult of a donkey and of course, this is, needs to be a cult that has never been ridden before, uh, and Jesus is going to need it. And so he says, go into town and grab it and tell whoever you talk to that the Lord is in need of this. Uh, and of course, they'll give it to you. And so this actually happens in scripture. We see as this happens, but uh, we see as Matthew and Simon Z are sent into town to go and grab that. At one point, Matthew says, so you want us to steal livestock? And Jesus says, borrow. <laughs> and then Matthew says, so you want us to borrow a burrow? For some reason, a lot of people love this line here. Then we get another short scene with Jesus and Mary. We see as things are kind of picking up here and things are beginning to get on the move. Mary actually brings Jesus his backpack, which he accidentally left in Bethany. Now, Jesus says, of course, it wasn't an accident. I wanted you to bring it to me, so I left it there. I knew you would think that I would need it. And so he grabs his backpack from his mother and they begin having a small conversation here. He actually says that the backpack is a representation of Joseph. And so it's like the three of them are together again, Joseph being his father, of course. And so they begin to talk about what this is going to be like. Mary talks about how it was so hard for her to hear Jesus talking about him being anointed for burial and everything that's going to be happening here. Now I've spoken with the chosen previously, and they've actually said on my channel in a comment that yes, Mary does understand everything that is going to be happening in this version of Mary. They do represent her as knowing what is going to be coming up and that Jesus is going to die and that you know, everything's kind of been revealed to her by Jesus uh, over time. I don't necessarily buy this <laughs> reading through scripture. Uh, it doesn't really make sense that this would be the case at all. Um, however, in The Chosen, I understand why they're doing it for story purposes and everything else. So um, it's fine, whatever, <laughs> here. But uh, Mary definitely knows during this point, and she's definitely getting more and more anxious and kind of sad as to what's upcoming here in the chosen. This leads Jesus to say, maybe you should stay here with Lazarus because he's asking Lazarus to stay in Bethany uh, for his safety and just for him to lay low for a while. Uh, but she, of course, really wants to be with Jesus during this time, and uh, and she wants to go with him. Jesus specifically says that he can't shield her from this anymore. Mary ends the scene by saying, one day at a time. And she just continues to follow him along. Then we cut back to Matthew and Simon the Zealot finding a donkey. At first, they look around the town and they see a donkey. They think that it's it. But then someone else uh, sits on it and rides off. And of course, that's a cult that's been ridden. So they can't 
use that one. They go off and they find another one uh, in a stable nearby and they find a colt next to a donkey. And one of the stable hands walks in and says, hey, why are you untying this colt? And uh, he says, uh, has it ever been ridden before? Has this colt ever been ridden before? And he's like, well, why are you taking it? What's going on? And uh, the, they say the Lord has need of it, just like Jesus said for them to say. And of course, he's kind of confused. <laughs> he's like, no, I don't think it's been written, but, but why are you taking it? <laughs> and again, they say the Lord has need of it. And then Simon the Zealot actually quotes Zechariah 9.9. 9. Uh, this is a prophecy from Zechariah that talks about Jesus riding in on a donkey, the cult of a donkey. And so this is a very important verse here. Now, what's really, really interesting is later on in just a second, we're going to see that this stable hand, his name is actually Zechariah as well. And so a uh, really cool connection point there between the verse and his name as well. Uh, and so they end up taking the cult and they return back to Jesus. Now, sporadically throughout this whole section of the end of the episode here, we're seeing as Atticus is kind of looking on. Uh, hiding behind some trees and watching as Jesus and his followers are doing certain things. He's definitely hyper aware as to what is happening here. He's definitely keeping an eye on this entire group during Passover for sure. During this scene here, Atticus actually commandeers another centurion's horse and rides off. We're not explicitly told where he's going or what he's doing though. Then we see a scene in Bethany as everybody's getting ready to leave and they're packing up. Everybody says, let's go, let's go. And they ask Lazarus if he's coming. And he says, no, Jesus asked me to stay here and lay low for a while. And then Andrew says, come on, time is running out. We got to go. We're already running late. Then we return to Jerusalem as that same stable hand that gave Simon Z and Matthew the colt runs into Jerusalem telling everybody that Jesus is coming through the Eastern gate. He's coming. Jesus is finally here. He even runs up to Solomon's portico and even talks to Jesse and Veronica as they're talking to a crowd of people, which I might be a part of. <laughs> if you look closely in the right side of the screen, you can see me actually in that group of people talking to Jesse and Veronica as Zechariah runs through and gets their attention as we all run out towards the Eastern gate. It was a fun scene. It was really cool to be a part of that small group there. This is where we learn the stable hands name as Veronica calls him Zechariah. Now, cutting back to that main street of Jerusalem, we see that Joanna and Chusa are now kind of stuck in this sea of people. Their cart can't go anywhere because there's so many people blocking the way. And of course, Chusa's complaining and complaining. Joanna, though, eventually gives gets out of the cart, says goodbye to Chusa, and goes off and starts buying palm fronds for everybody in this group here. Really, really a cool scene. And during all of this as well, Caiaphas is watching over the people that are all walking around below, kind of in disgust. Of course, he's trying to figure out what to do here. He's trying to figure out how to handle this whole Jesus situation, which of course we'll learn more about in season five and season six. And then ending out this episode, we get a scene with Jesus and the apostles as they're all preparing to leave and go into Jerusalem for the triumphal entry and the beginning of Holy Week, which is season five. We see as they're preparing the donkey, putting their cloaks over the donkey and putting the bridle on the donkey that Jesus gives them. Jesus pulls us out of his bag, and gives it to them. Of course, this is the bridle that has been somehow magically transported through the time of Moses and David onto Jesus. Now, I understand historical artifacts and things, and maybe this is one of those things that never degraded from the time of Moses, but um, yeah, I don't know. We'll talk about that in our deep dives as well. This is one of the things that I've kind of been always a little bit iffy about the whole bridal thing. And this is where Jesus kind of gives his final talking points to his apostles before they head into Jerusalem. He says, the time has come. I must do the will of my father in heaven. I know you all have many questions and there will be time for those later, but for now, will you come with me? No matter what happens, I want you to know that in this world, I loved you as my own and I will love you till the end. Will you come with me? And this is where Peter, the rock, of course, the leader of this group says, Lord, where else would we go? You are the only one with the words of eternal life. Now, this originally is actually said way earlier on, right after the feeding of the 5,000, when a lot of the disciples are leaving Jesus because he's, you know, telling them the truth and they don't like it. Um, he says, are you guys going to leave too? And then Peter says, Lord, where else would we go? You're the only one with eternal life, uh, with the words of eternal life. And so this is kind of a misplaced scripture as well, but I think it does work really well here as well, going into, uh, you know, the triumphal entry, going into Holy Week, going into the crucifixion of Jesus and everything that's going to be happening here. 
here. Peter, of course, doesn't really know what he's saying here. He doesn't really know what's upcoming and what's going to actually be happening, uh, but he's confident that he's going to follow Jesus uh, just like he was in John chapter 6 when this happens previously. And then the last line that Jesus says here is, no matter what happens this week, no matter what you see, feel, think, or do, I want you to know that in this world I loved you as my own and I will love you till the end. And that is when they begin their journey into Jerusalem and we cut to the credits for season four. Very intense episode for sure. Overall, it's a lot of setup for season five. Definitely not as good as episode seven. Episode seven, I think, was as close to a perfect episode this season as we could get. Episode eight was very, very good, but it was a lot of setup for the future and kind of explaining what is going to happen later on. Of course, we have the connection from David to Jesus with the anointing of the lamb. Uh, again, I'm not sure how biblical that is or how traditional that is or where that happens in history. I haven't really found any evidence of that or if it's just something that's been taught over time um, however it is really an interesting connection point there and of course we know that Jesus was anointed for his death beforehand uh, whether or not that six days or, or whatever is actually a real thing or not so anyway a lot of really cool things of course during our deep dives we'll clarify all of this kind of stuff we'll jump into a lot of different details and we're starting from episode one so hopefully whenever the episodes come out on the app which I hope is soon <laughs> uh, then we will uh, continue on on with those deep dives and talk about all those different things. Until then, we're going to be talking about a bunch of different stuff, including news coming up with The Chosen, including other TV shows that are in the works right now, including filming for season five and all the stuff that's happening in between. There's a lot that's going to be talked about on this channel, so make sure you subscribe, make sure you like this video, and we'll see you guys on the next one.